please welcome back the director of the Pigeon Tunnel, Errol Morris. I'm just going to say it's impossible not to acknowledge the awkward meta level of uh, doing an interview uh, with a director after seeing this film. <laughs> What's meta about it? We're both sitting here. Yes, but I mean, we're going to have a conversation. It's an interview. I'm all you've got. <laughs> um, <laughs> More than enough. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to start with the basic question, which is, what was it about David Cornwell that interested you, um, that made you want to make this film? Well, I often say that the decision to make a movie is often paired with the knowledge that someone will pay for it. <laughs> Believe it or not, that is a major consideration. Um, I was interested in, in doing this. Um, fortunately, uh, David Cornwell was also interested. And so we sat down and we talked for four days. I loved the memoir, The Pigeon Tunnel, still do. I think it's one of his very, very best books. And I'm very fortunate that Adam Sisman had written a formal biography of John le Carre, David Cornwell, that had come out. And David being a rather competitive gentleman, decided he could do better. And so he wrote The Pigeon Tunnel, which is really not an autobiography per se. It doesn't start at the beginning and then ramble on through to the bitter end or close to the bitter end. Instead, it's a series of parables, epigrams, stories stitched together. And it's quite remarkable particularly the bookends, which I loved. Uh, they're like strange Kafka parables. Uh, the Pigeon Tunnel, which is at the very, very beginning of the book, the frontispiece of the book. And at the very end, the story of Rudolf Hess's in flight to Scotland in 1941, uh, presumably to engineer a peace between the Third Reich and Her Majesty's government. What a strange story. And I don't know what you make of those two parables. I'm not even sure what I make of those two parables. But they're endlessly evocative. They're endlessly suggestive. Uh, and I suppose if I had to pick any really good reason for making this movie would be those two bookends to the Pigeon Tunnel itself. I love them. So what do you make of them? <laughs> you tell me. Well, I guess they lead me into another question about form because um, the form you take when you make your films um, is different from film to film. I, I would maybe say it's an evolution, but um, that may be, be presumptuous. Um, but I'm wondering if you can talk a you little bit. You mean in the sense that I'm an evolution from the unicellular animals? Well, may, maybe a subset of that. Um, I'm wondering if you can just talk about um, some of the stylistic decisions you made to cover this material. Years ago, I was asked by Roger Ebert 
what is the difference between documentary and drama? And I said, well, that's a really easy question. It's two zeros. Um, uh, whatever documentary is, and I'm not sure that I have any clue whatsoever, it's an opportunity to reinvent the form each time you make a movie. Uh, why not experiment? Why not try different things? Uh, I'm not sure I even like documentary. I'm not sure that I even want to make another one, although I seem to be still at it. Um, maybe I'm a documentary addict of some kind. I don't know. Um, one interesting thing about it is drama can always play the game that it's not truly connected to the real world. It's an excursion into the purely imaginative. Whereas with documentary, you always have this knowledge floating around somewhere that there is a connection between the film and the world around it. I often compare uh, John le Carré to Joseph Conrad because you can go through Conrad's novels and you could say, well, he went to this place, he went to that place, he went to the Congo, he went to Panama, and so on and so forth, and these works of literature were a result. Well, the same is true in David Cornwell's case. There is a documentary element that runs throughout his many, many, many novels. Uh, they're endlessly researched, carefully observed, and he produced, like Conrad, this incredible body of literature. Uh, someone wrote to me, forgive me if I'm just babbling here, I do have that tendency. But someone wrote to me and they said, well, I see that John le Carré believed in the subjectivity of truth. And they cited the scene. It's very near the end of the movie. I walked in on it just before they turned that godforsaken spotlight on me. <laughs> and he says that everybody sees the world differently, which is inarguably true. But there is an objective truth uh, observed by some, how he describes it, absent third party, whoever in hell that might be, God or whatever. But it comes very close to my own idea of truth, that there is objective truth. There's a world out there. Uh, we don't invent it for ourselves every day and every other day. Uh, I made a movie, The Thin Blue Line, where I spent three years investigating a murder in Texas, uh, a murder which was uh, it ended as a terrible miscarriage of justice. A guy who didn't commit the killing of this Dallas police officer came within three days of being electrocuted in the Texas death chamber. Um, you know, as uh, Stephen Hawking would say, knowledge that you are to be hanged in the morning surely concentrates the mind. So do I believe in objective truth? I do. But do I believe that it's that easily accessible? Evidence gets corrupted, lost, misinterpreted. Um, it's an endless pattern of research, investigation, inquiry to try to determine what happened. But this movie, The Pigeon Tunnel, is more my exploration of how David Cornwell sees the world. Uh, his philosophy, his philosophical insights. Uh, and I found 
I would say much to my surprise that he was a deeply moral, deeply ethical man who believed passionately in right and wrong, in good and in evil. Uh, there's a story which you've just seen of his invitation to Moscow. Uh, the host invites him to a dinner with Kim Philby and David declines. Why, he tells us, because he couldn't see himself having dinner with the Queen's representative one evening and with the Queen's traitor on another. Um, I find him and this film endlessly fascinating, endlessly interesting. The progression from a story about string pulling, dupes, and those who dupe others that ended up with my favorite of all of his novels, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. And I link The Pigeon Tunnel to that particular novel and the extraordinary movie that resulted from that extraordinary novel, the Martin Ritt movie with Richard Burton. Um, the feeling that people are endlessly manipulated by the higher powers. And then at the end, the question of what is history? Confronted with what may be one of the deepest historical mysteries of our current era, and the mystery of why in hell the second ranking officer in the Reich would hijack a plane and fly to Scotland. What in hell was he thinking? What was he trying to achieve? What was the inherent motivation? And at the end of the movie, he tells us, I serve as a kind of midwife in all of this. I'm not sure that's the correct expression, but I'll use it anyway. That history is chaos. History isn't conspiracy. History isn't string pullers and dupes. History is just utter madness. People working at cross purposes with each other and even with themselves, producing an infernal mess. Something, by the way, that if you're living in the current era, you might be a little bit familiar with. Um, <laughs> we are. Uh, he also says in the course of this film that for him, um, every act of writing is a process of self-discovery. Um, and I'm just wondering... Sounds good. Yeah. I'm wondering for you, as you're making films and your curiosity is open about your subject, if it's also a process of self-discovery for you. Um, seems a little too pat for me. Um, I make movies to learn something. Uh, I shared... Uh, David's horror. So he goes to Bonn in 1960, 61. So he's right there at the beginnings of the Berlin Wall, the height of the Cold War in Germany. And he finds that there are people in the government, in the new German government, Bundesrepublik, who are Nazis. Uh, they're Nazis. Hans Globke, the progenitor of the Nuremberg Laws. Okay? This is what made, in many ways, the Holocaust possible. Is now the second ranking person in the new government. 
And David asked the question, why did we fight this war? What was that ultimately about? And he talks about enforced forgetting, as if life is like an endless magic slate where the past is lifted off the acetate uh, window pane and something else takes its place. Ron DeSantis would like that idea. Wow. Nothing. I'm just. I'm just. Uh, just wanted to make sure you were <laughs> completed the thought. Um, yeah, I could have made a much longer film. There are just so many things in the pigeon tunnel which were of incredible interest. Um, and the fact that he's describing his life and the real world and history. I mean, it became pretty obvious, if it hadn't been obvious to everybody anyway, but obvious to me, because I was making the film, that the spy who came in from the cold was made in this crucible of history. This stuff is happening around him. Uh, you see the, the shots um, of Lemus, and, uh, uh, the shots of the his true love sliding down the wall accompanied by historical footage of people jumping from balconies um, and at least I felt this close connection between history and his work uh, it made making the movie really really interesting and is a justification, if there is ever a justification for such a thing, for it being a documentary. No questions from the audience? No, because we, we, it's, it's so big and dark and vast and, and, and ask, we- Ask somebody something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one person yell out a question. <laughs> But everyone's scared because of your introduction. You realize that. No, they're okay, not. Okay, go. Right in the middle. This is one of the craziest kinds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me if this sounds insulting, because it is. Is there something that he's not revealing about himself? Well, I would hope so. You know, this is not an interrogation, no matter what anyone tells you about this movie, it's not. And for me, interviews have never been adversarial, they're just not. There's an opportunity to learn something. The stuff which has made a difference for me in my life and in my work have been interviews where I learn something where I haven't even bothered to ask a question. Someone has just volunteered some crazy piece of information of their own accord, and they offered it because it's the principle, it's best to shut the fuck up. <laughs> In the Thin Blue Line, I had this crazy, crazy eyewitness, supposed eyewitness, Emily Miller, and I could never find the lineup sheet uh, where she supposedly fingered this defendant, Randall Dale Adams. And um, she explained to me, without my really asking, the sheet doesn't exist because she failed to pick out the defendant in the police lineup. So I ask, I believe innocently. How do you know you failed? I was curious. I said, I know. I said, okay, I know you know, but how do you know? He says, I know because 
The cop sitting next to me in the lineup room told me I picked out the wrong person and then pointed out the right person so I wouldn't make that mistake again. This isn't an interrogation. This is me, probably a bozo myself, talking to another bozo. <laughs> and getting a crucial piece of information. Are things withheld? Tell me, I can't identify you who asked the question, do you ever withhold information from others? <laughs> Wittingly or unwittingly, I hope to God the answer is yes. Well, that's the perfect opportunity for us to leave the stage with questions yet unasked of you. But thank you so much. Thank for you so very, very much. Thank you all for being here.